What about the rapture? You know, most of the quote-unquote religious world of today believe in what is called the rapture. Did you know that this word is not found anywhere in the Holy Scriptures? Not even once? Not one time is it ever found in the Word of God. Now there's a different variety, several different varieties of this rapture that is so talked about by many people. And they differ slightly in a few areas. And while I don't want to go into in depth to any of them today, I will talk about the most common type a little bit. You know, over the years, there have been quite a few people who have predicted the end of the world. They say on a certain day, on a certain time, the world is going to end. But, you know, the dates come and they go, and guess what happens? This whole world is still here. Uh, no sign of the Son of God. And there's a reason for that, but it's a common belief among many religious people today that when Christ returns that he'll quietly uh, come and he'll carry away saints in what is called and, and, and named as many people name it as the rapture. They believe that some will be taken from their jobs, some will be taken from their families, some will be taken from their friends, and no one will know where they've gone. No one will know what has happened. Uh, and whatever you're doing, you'll just be quietly interrupted and you'll just disappear. Uh, there's even some TV shows that have portrayed this very, very scenario. Uh, leaving behind friends and family members and co-workers. Their claim is that they'll be missed, but it's not known exactly where they've gone. But that they have gone. Uh, they'll simply vanish and uh, some of them will make guesses as to where they've gone and maybe they've gone to, to be with God or whatever. And their belief is that Jesus will take them from this world that they know for a period of seven years. Seven years. And the ones that are left behind will be those that are unjust, those that are not Christian. And that they'll continue to live on this earth for this seven year period, uh, which is termed the tribulation. Satan will be loosed. He'll be able to roam around on this earth during that seven years. And if any of the unjust which have been left behind <clears throat> will have a mind to, they'll be given a second opportunity or another opportunity <clears throat> excuse me, to turn to God. They'll believe that they'll have a second chance at heaven. But at the end of this seven years, that there'll be a great war fought, and the name of it will be Armageddon. And on the third appearance, after this battle is fought, on the third appearance of Christ, he will bring this battle to an end, and he will establish a kingdom upon this earth for a period of a thousand years. And after which will come the end of the world and the great judgment and their eternity in heaven. I think I can safely say that that's wishful thinking to think that God is going, uh, and that's being nice, is going to give you a second opportunity. Uh, the notion is if you don't get it right the first time, don't worry because you're going to have a second chance. That notion has no biblical foundation whatsoever. Zero. No foundation, no uh, at all, no foundation of having a second opportunity. But there are many, many scriptures that contradict having a second chance or another opportunity. I've heard it said many times by uh, a number of people, and I believe it probably the, the case, the truth, that religious confusion exists because of not what the Bible says, but what it doesn't say. 
And one example of that is instrumental music. It has caused more confusion in the religious world because it's not addressed. Uh, and this thought or idea of the rapture is a perfect example. That word is never used in the scriptures. So how are we to know the truth and what are we to believe? Well, if we look at uh, Galatians 1, beginning with verse 8, it says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached let, unto you, let him be accursed. And we said before, so say we again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. Do you see that in these two scriptures, Paul repeated that same scenario, that same statement twice. Let him be accursed. If someone preaches something that's not in the inspired word of God, let that person be accursed. To know the truth, to know what God expects of us, and to know what God's will is and what's going to, to take place, we have to read the Bible. We have to study the Bible. Uh, and we have to believe it. Now I want to look at uh, some important biblical scriptures. Uh, John 14, uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. One thing we can be sure of, that Christ is coming again. Uh, we have his word. We have his promise. However, no man will know the day or the, or the hour. Uh, when someone says this is the time that the Lord is going to come back, don't take any stock in it because the Bible's clear. Uh, when people claim to do that, uh, no one knows, not even Jesus himself. They attempt to predict uh, these things. But Matthew 24 and, and verse 36 says, But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You see that last statement, my Father only. God alone, only God knows the day and the hour that Christ will return. Mark 13 and verse 32 says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. God has that set aside that only He knows. Only He. Not even Christ, no one but the Father. So God and only God knows when Christ is going to return. Uh, remember one of the opening scriptures that we started off with, Second Peter? It says that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Why do you suppose God has given us this warning that the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night? He's going to come unexpected because we don't expect a thief to come in the middle of the night, do we? Uh, Matthew 24 and 44, we're told, be ready. So if God is going to send His Son as a thief in the night and tells us to be ready, do you think that God would want us to be ready for the return of Christ? Absolutely. That we shouldn't take it foolishly, but we should take it seriously. Be ready. Uh, if today... You don't get anything else out of this lesson. If you get zero out of it, I want you to take, get one thing and take it home with you, and that is that you must be ready to meet God. You must be ready when the Lord comes. Um, the Bible also tells us that Christ's return will not be a quiet one. It's not going to be like He sneaks in and takes some people away and leaves the rest. Uh, that's contradictory of what the Bible says. Uh, 
It'll be announced with shouts from heaven by angels, the scripture says, and by the trump of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16 tells us that, and that it will not be a quiet return. Revelations 1 and 7 tells us that every eye shall see him. So it's not going to be something that you're curious about and you look around and, and you don't know where somebody's gone and they're gone. It's not going to happen that way. The angels will announce it. The trump of God will, uh, will sound. And that the scripture says all, not just the saved, but all will know the return of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and 28 tells us that when Christ returns, that will mark the end and God will be all in all. It'll be complete. There's not going to be anything else. There's not going to be seven more years. And then there's not going to be a thousand years on this earth. There's not going to be a second chance. That's going to be the end, the scripture says, and that God will be all in all. And that all will stand before God. Matthew 25 and verse 31 tells us that when the Son of Man comes, he shall separate the sheep from the goats. So both the righteous and the wicked are going to know that Christ's return uh, has happened. It's not going to take away uh, the sheep and the goats not know wh what's going on. Everyone is going to know. 1 Corinthians 15 and 51 says that we'll all be changed. We certainly will because that's the mark of the end. That's the end as the scripture says that God will be all in all and we'll be changed. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye we'll be changed. That quick. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 17 says that the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord and will be with him forever. You see that they'll be caught up. The Lord's not going to set foot on this earth. He's not going to uh, have a seven-year reign here on this earth and then uh, have a thousand, uh, the war of Armageddon, and then a thousand years for people to live on this earth, and then a judgment. It's not going to happen that way. There'll be no seven-year tribulation. There'll be no thousand-year reign. There's no third coming of Christ. Uh, no second chances for anyone to come to the knowledge of the Lord. God is not a respecter of person. He tells us that Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Be ready. Do you think if He is a gracious, loving God and He's not a respecter of persons that He would give thousands of people a second chance when he hadn't given anyone else a second chance? No. You want a fair and honest judge, don't you, to stand before? How would it be to go before God and say, well, Lord, you gave all of these other people a second chance, so how about me? God says, he'll come as a thief in the night, be ready. Be ready. No seven-year tribulation, no thousand-year reign, no third coming. No second chances. On the day that Christ return, we'll all be appear before that judgment seat of God. Every one of us. Uh, and we'll give an account of our lives, good and bad. Uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 25 and 34, we're told that the righteous shall be at his right hand. Those people that have obeyed the gospel, that have been forgiven, that their sins have been washed away, and they've lived faithfully as a Christian, they'll be at his right hand. And he, the, the scripture says he'll tell them, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. He's prepared a kingdom, but he's prepared it for those righteous. In verse 41 he says, to those at his left hand, that's those that are on the other side, who are unfaithful, do you know what he says? Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. It's not a good thought, is it? It's either going to be the best and happiest day of eternity or it's going to be the worst possible day you could ever imagine. The second coming of Christ is as fundamental to Christians and their faith as, as His birth, His death, His burial, His resurrection. We believe that Christ is going to come again. Ever since His ascension into heaven, Christ's disciples have anxiously awaited uh, and looked forward to the day that He's going to return. Why? Because we know that that's going to mark the end and that we'll be in heaven with Him forever. Uh, 
That's his promise. That's his promise to the faithful. Remember what we read earlier in John chapter 14. Don't be troubled. He goes to prepare a place and he'll come and receive us again unto him. Where I go, you go. Uh, Acts 1, uh, beginning with verse 9, says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. From that moment on and throughout the book of Acts, the epistles, uh, uh, and even in, in Revelations, the Holy Spirit has promised over and over and over again that the Son of God is coming again. He will. He's coming. Faithful Christians really believe that promise, and, and their convictions uh, show that they believe that promise. It, it affects not only the way... Uh, our lives here but the way we live our lives it, it affects every aspect of our lives because we put stock in it we have faith in it we believe it um, it affects what we do and what we don't do because we want to be pleasing to God we're not told when Christ will return but we are told that he will so we can believe that he will return and we can really believe that we can take that to the bank as the saying goes so we must get ready and that's the principle here get ready Christ is coming we don't know when but he's coming get ready and stay ready when we leave this physical world there's not going to be another chance there's not going to be a second opportunity for uh, a few that happen to be left when the Lord comes that have ever been born and set foot on this earth. God's not a respecter of persons in any fashion whatsoever. He won't give one preference over another. We will not have a second chance. It's true that the day of the Lord to return, the day that the Lord returns is going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a glorious day for Christians. It's going to be the happiest day that you could ever imagine. You know, some of the New Testament Christians didn't want to die before the Lord returned. They had preached that one day the Lord would return. And some of them were, were dying as we die today. And they were concerned, those that were living, that those Christians in Thessalonica might be at a disadvantage because they've already died and been put in the grave. It was explained to them that... They won't miss out on anything. Actually, they'll be the first fruits of the Lord because the dead in Christ shall rise first to meet Him in the air. Uh, indeed, it will be a great and glorious day for the Christian when they see the Lord face to face. Uh, but what a dreadful and fearful day it's going to be for those people that have never obeyed the gospel. For those people that put it off thinking, oh, I'm going to get a second chance someday. So why rush into anything? Why do anything? You don't have a second chance. I simply can't reinforce enough that the things of this world are so very unimportant when it comes to your spiritual eternity. They don't hold a candle. Especially in the view of the eternal nature of heaven because it's forever. The things here are only temporary. Um, it is this hope that takes away many a tears on the death of, of a loved one, knowing that when they were left this world, they're faithful, and they're going to be in a better place forever. It's comforting. Our faith tells us that they're going to be with God one day forever. That's a comfort, just like it's a comfort to us, knowing if we leave this life in a prepared state, if we're ready when the Lord comes, we're going to be with Him forever. And it's that hope and promise that when Christ returns, that His faithful followers are going to be taken before the this judgment and then ushered into heaven for all eternity. I feel so fortunate and I feel so blessed to, to have that hope because God has given me that promise of an eternal home in heaven if I'm faithful. 
I feel fortunate to be a child of God. That when it comes time to take that step from this world, physical world, into that spiritual world, that I'll be able to see God and be with God forever. You know, you can put your hope in a lot of different things in this world and in this life. But if you put it in anything other than Christ and the Son of God, you're putting it in false security, just like those folks that predict what day the Lord's going to come, and He never does, because no one knows except God Himself. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, oh, I beg you to hear what God says about becoming a Christian and be obedient to the gospel. You know, we're to hear the Word of God, we're to believe it, be repentful, be baptized, or confess Christ as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sin. It's then and only then that we have our sins washed away and that we can stand justified in the eyes of God. And then we live a faithful life, knowing and waiting on the return of our Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I urge you, please, please consider it this morning. If you are a Christian and maybe you've fallen away, come back home. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement. Use it as an invitation to the Lord.